Well, there's an introduction for you. <laughs> so now I've got to persuade you that this matters to you, uh, because that's what this is about. Because, you know, governments can't sort this. We are moving forwards in trying to raise the spectre of reality. Indeed, and I'll come back to this, we ran with support from the Wellcome Trust, the Ghanaian government, the Thai government, a big call to action about antimicrobial resistance a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, and clearly it hit our airwaves, but if you look top left, you'll see it hit the Indian airwaves. And we talked about the post-apocalyptic scenario of Fleming's bugs getting their way. And the sad thing is, they are, at the moment, winning this race. Now, when I first became aware of how badly this had gone wrong back in 2013 and published an annual report, I thought, we don't have the data. So what I've got is all these experts saying, actually, we've got a problem. We've got an empty pipeline and the bugs are getting more and more resistance. So I asked the Prime Minister, Cameron, to ask a senior economist to do a Stern-type review, because this is as bad as climate change, and we're doing it to ourselves, and it'll kill us all off, or at least our children and their children, before climate change gets there. We've got to do something about it. So we got Jim O'Neill to look at this, and at the moment, we reckon about 700,000 people are dying around the world of drug-resistant infections. You might say, if you look at this, that it's not much compared with cancer, diabetes, and things like that. But just think of 60,000 newborn babies dying of drug-resistant sepsis in India every year, and the tragedy that is to those families, and the waste. It's not fair. It's not right. And actually, part of the problem is because we all take the drugs and walk on the other side of the road. So he looked at this, and though it's not a full picture, um, what we do know is that these drug-resistant infections are already hitting the vulnerable of our society. We've, we've nicknamed them the yuppies, the young, the old, the pregnant, and immune-compromised. Just remember how many in this room are immune-compromised diabetes, on treatment for cancer, post-transplantation. Some people, just because their genes gave them that a poor resistance to infections. This matters to our society. So, how is it in England? In England, we know that at least 5,000 people die every year because the antibiotics don't work already mainly of E. coli and Klebsiella. And sadly, already, four out of ten patients who get E. coli don't respond to the commonest antibiotics. And that resistance, year on year, is going up, and our treatment options are running out. And we know that antibiotics are vital to our society. Did you know, I'm horrified by this data, actually, one in three of us take antibiotics at least once a year. Over 850 million tablets prescribed and 5 million bottles of antibiotics to children under 10. So we're treating them like smarties. People don't seem to understand that if it's a viral infection, it won't work. So we've got the fact that at least one in four prescriptions, I think that comes up now, no, one in four prescriptions are inappropriate and don't work. And we've somehow got to take people with us on that journey of thinking, do I really need this antibiotic? Now, when we did some research, we discovered that if people hear, a lot of people hear from their doctor, you don't need an antibiotic, they think the poor doctor is trying to save money rather than save their life and the life of their families later on by protecting them. So what did Jim show us? He did work on where we were going and showed that if we didn't change things, then actually the death rate would be greater than cancer. It would be about 10 million a year by 2050. He modelled the impact on the economy and it's dramatic. The equivalent of losing the UK's GDP 
every year from the global output. Now, lots of people poo-pooed this and said it wasn't good enough and wasn't right. So we persuaded the World Bank to have a go. And what they discovered was that actually it would knock the GDP of poor countries and push over 28 million people into poverty who wouldn't have been there otherwise because of drug-resistant infections. Now, if you're not feeling scared yet, you blooming well ought to be, because this is going to wipe out growth across the world if we don't sort it. And I also want to highlight that what we need to do is show and get it sorted, because otherwise those um, issues agreed in 2015 of the global um, sustainable development goals won't happen. So, to sort it, we need partnership. We need individuals to play their roles. We need partnerships, not just at government level. We're going to need technology like we've been talking about, so we use what we've got effectively. We need the pharma companies. We need everyone working with us. But it puts at risk all sorts of SDGs, as we call them, not just number three, that green one on, in the middle of the second row about healthy lives and well-being, but lots of other ones about water, health, they're directly at risk. And we'll get poverty because of issues in, directly at risk. And we just need to get on and do it all. So you will be saying, so what's she been doing? She's been preaching this and saying it for a few years now, since 2013. We've raised awareness and we're beginning to look at how we sort the problem of the empty pipeline. Because, you know, in our armatarium, we have no new drugs come into clinical practice that weren't basically discovered by the late 80s. We get new variants and things which might be better, but essentially we have got a market failure. We thought it was solved in the 60s, 70s and 80s, so people disinvested in the research. It's got steadily worse. And, of course, no one really wants to go back into it because we don't pay enough for our antibiotics. So we're having to work with pharma, with economists across the world to look at different market pull mechanisms as, while we're doing the market push and the basic research and trying to regenerate this group of people who understand bugs. And then when they understand bugs, they'll know what makes them tick and we can stop them ticking and we can get new drugs. And every time, as I say, I lift a stone up on antimicrobial resistance and think, right, so if we do that, that and that, we, we stand a chance, I discover a complexity. So whether it's uh, aquaculture, I was in Singapore, and on Tuesday afternoon, they were showing me pictures of their fish farms and how they're vaccinating fish, barramundi, Asian sea bass. But, and you couldn't see the line, the Malaysian fish farms on the other side were just pouring antibiotics straight into their nets with the fish held in the sea. And do you know the Philippines, they use common antibiotics including amoxicillin, tetracycline and chloramphenicol just tipped into their fish farming. That's one of the complexities. What about how antibiotics are produced? Well, if the active pharmaceutical ingredients and the actual manufacturing is badly done, then they're just discharging waste straight out into the rivers, the water table. High-use farms, other high-use um, high hospitals without good sewage, out it goes to poison the environment. There's a problem with the agriculture and food chain. Over 70% of antibiotics across the world are used for growth promotion. Now, we should treat sick animals, but just because you haven't done your hygiene and sanitation well, does that mean that you should abuse um, the uh, antibiotics by using them for growth promotion? Because it will stimulate resistance. Wonderful story of chickens actually in Canada. I can tell you the story because they're now on top of it. They, tr they mapped how and tracked 
how when they used a certain antibiotic, they got resistant salmonella that infected humans. And when they took the antibiotic out, it went down and humans weren't getting ill. So the food chain. And I try and explain to people why it matters to them as people. So if I get ill and I go, I think I've knocked it off, never mind, and um, have an antibiotic given to me, it may treat that infection. If it's bacterial, we hope it will. But it may also give me antibiotic-resistant bugs in my gut, my microbiome, that can sit there for 6 to 12 months. What happens if I, as many middle-aged women, get a urinary tract infection? It's usually a bug from my own gut. If it's resistant, well, I'm in a mess, aren't I? I'll be peeing all the time and it'll be painful, to say the least, let alone the impact on my kidney function. It matters to everyone in this room. And if it doesn't matter to you yet, all I can say is you've been lucky and this is really complex and we've got to get it right. And we've got to get it right globally, because you know, we know bugs know no borders, and this is some work, as you can see from Berlin, just showing if you map transport, what you can see is we're closer in Heathrow to Hong Kong, where I will be next week, than we actually are to Birmingham and Glasgow, because of the number of people moving between them. So what we have to do is use these models to map where the resistance is going and we have to work together on surveillance, on getting the solutions. And that's exactly what this call to action conference in Berlin was, which I started by talking about. And what we saw was we have to build new partnerships, public, private, philanthropic, civil society, just as we heard about the deep tech. We've got to move forward the innovative research ideas. I love this one of a 3D printed cow shoe with antibiotic in it that stops the infection getting into the environment and infecting other cows while treating it at the same time. We've got to get new public-private partnerships for vaccines or improving the effectiveness of them. New technologies. What about drones for delivery, mobiles for diagnostics and for surveillance? Much better social media to increase public awareness and ownership. We've got to get people, each of you in this room, and everyone, to drive demand for clean environments, for better food, to change things. Do you know the consumers in the States have changed the food pr production of the suppliers too? Many companies, McDonald's is the latest and top of the list. And... We've got to make the case for investment. So I hope I've managed to persuade you that this matters to you, each of you, to your families. I go on this advocacy because I care about the life of my children and my future grandchildren. And it is soluble. If only we look after the ones we've got the drugs we've got, if only we prevent infections with cleanliness, with sanitation, with vaccination. All of that needs innovation too. And it's soluble because there are more antibiotics to find, more drugs. Now, I've focused on antibiotics because that's the biggest risk. But don't forget TB. Don't forget HIV. 7% of people with HIV are resistant to first-line drugs. Don't forget the resistance in malaria and how many that kills. This is a problem of infection. If we treat it, then as you heard earlier, Darwinism and survival of the fittest means they change to resist that infection. And if we don't fight back, the bugs will win. Please change your lives to change everyone else's. Thank you. <laughs>